The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at AfricaChinaReporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, and our Africa editor Jeronima in Mauritius. A very good afternoon to both of you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening to you. Kobus, Jero, this is my favorite show of the year. It's a show, Kobus, that you and I have been doing for now going on 14 years, where every year we get together and we look back at the key themes and the key stories in China-Africa relations. Kobus, I think this year it's going to be a little bit different for us because it feels as if when we look back at the relationship that it has changed a lot in recent years. And just before we get started, you wrote a column this week for our subscribers talking about the incredible shrinking Africa-China relationship. Maybe just before we get into what we think each of our top three stories are for the year, give us that overview of what you wrote in that column. Well, my argument was that as the China-Africa economic relationship is kind of stagnating, you know, and th this is a point I think that you've made like repeatedly in, in the past, that, that even though trade, for example, is growing objectively as a share of China's total trade, it remains very flat. And that in, to a large extent investment, that the main investors in Africa, like foreign direct investors, I think China's number five. All of the other ones are Western powers. You know, so, so we've made that point before. The economic relationship isn't as important as the political relationship. But I also started wondering how important the political relationship actually is you know and and there that that's still kind of an open question for me i like i haven't kind of come to a conclusion like you know kind of african votes are important in the un and you know and, and china does tend to court global south voices but there's no space there necessarily for any kind of shared agenda building or any kind of real promotion or conclusive promotion of an African agenda, among others, because there isn't really an African agenda. There isn't really a set of, of, of development you know, priorities, for example, that the continent really agrees on. And so in, in that context, it, it seems like it's like the relationship is shrinking on, on all levels, you know, kind of it's really not really moving forward. Whereas China's relationship with other, you know, significant areas, particularly the Middle East, has been essentially remade in the last year. So that was the kind of thinking behind the piece. And Joel, let's get your broad brush as you look back on the year. Don't reveal any of the three points that you're going to bring up in our discussion today, but give us your reflection back on the year overall. Oh, the year for me was a quite interesting one to see how the China-Africa relations has changed over the years and how Africa is adapting in that new context and how they are approaching the, the new China, what I'm calling the new China, the China post BRI 2.0, the China in the new context of BRICS and everything. So yeah, for me, it's now looking back on how this African continent now is adapting in that new environment, how they're understanding how China is working and if they're really ready to deal with that new China, a China that's now in a position of geopolitical conflict with the West, how they're managing that conflict, how they're balancing themselves in that context. So yeah, it's more of that looking into how Africa is going for the year ahead to be able to play its card right, to be able to move forward its own agenda. As Kobe said, there's, there's no much of agenda that you can see, but if at the end they come up with one, let's say, at a certain extent, a kind of agenda, how they're going to move forward with that, taking into account that China has changed and China approaching in Africa has changed as well. Okay, well, let's get into it now that we've got both of your thematics about the year that was. Here's how this show works. Each of us brings three stories or themes from the past year, and we don't know what each other's saying. We don't know which ones they're going to have, so we might overlap. We may be different. It's always interesting to see if we have the same points. I think this year it might be a little bit different. And then at the end of the show, we're going to give a preview of what's to come. And then in January, when we come back after a short break, we have a really exciting show planned for everybody where we're going to reach out to our network of experts, and we're going to get them to record little voice memos of what they think is coming in the year ahead. So if you're thinking about what's going to happen in 2024, 
Don't worry, that's going to come in January. Today, we're going to focus on what happened in 2023. Giro, we're going to let you start. What is one of your three stories or themes that you think define the year in Africa-China relations? For me, the year in review for Africa-China this year, the first story is about China literacy in Africa. I'm putting it in the context of the China-Africa relation where we've seen a lot of visits of African leaders in China. And as well as when we take into account how China has changed, as I said earlier, in terms of the BRI 2.0, the new change, the small and beautiful or small yet smart, something like that. And uh, how in that context now Africa has been able to navigate that area, that circumstances, it's comes really in a moment where now China is not lending that much money to Africa, where Africa is still need of financing for its development. But China has kind of moved away from those huge, big investment projects they used to do in Africa. And how Africa now, still seeking for that money, needs to adapt itself in an approach where they can really get something out of China. And when you put in the context where you have in the background the debt crisis issue, and in the background you also have all those African leaders visiting in China hoping to get one billion and I even remembered one of the stories that we've covered and that really get us a lot of trouble from the DRC when we call out President Chisekedi saying that he wasted his time going to China not really understanding how China has changed now and what to get away from China. I think I remember that people really wrote kind of a lot of nasty and mean comments in a certain way but down the line today we are at December 2023 and we realized that yes we call it right it was really a waste of time and his trip to China and the way it was a waste of time mind you the DRC is the only African country that has that level of leverage in, towards China that can really get something out of China but still even DRC managed to get nothing out of China. Mind you, a few days after visiting China, Argentina, I think Argentina economic minister got off with almost $9 billion out of China. It just tells you how much many African countries have just lost touch, I would say, or don't just don't understand how China has changed. And that's really, as I was saying in my topic, like the China literacy needs to really to improve a lot among African countries. They need to know how they're going to move forward with China, what China's agenda now, what China's approach, what China's priority now, and how themselves they can align their own agenda. And when I say own agenda, I'm going beyond their own political short-term agenda, but their own country's political agenda, how they're going to align it with China in a way to get the best of China-Africa relation. Now that China has moved from all those billions of dollars, how in the, in the area of smart and beautiful, they can still win something out of that relation. This is my first topic that when I think of the 2023 between China and Africa. Yeah, this came to really the fore this year. In Cobus, it's really interesting because in previous years, the Chinese came to Africa. They came with plans, they came with ideas, they came with money, they came with initiative, and they came with ambition. That in many ways defined the China-Africa relationship from the early 2000s right up until the pandemic. Now, as you've pointed out, Cobus, and as Giro has mentioned about this China literacy question, the Chinese aren't coming as forcefully as they used to. So it's incumbent on African stakeholders, policymakers, think tanks, scholars to come up with the ideas to go to China to pitch. And I think this year revealed some shortcomings, major shortcomings in that ideation of how to engage China. Kobus, you're in that space in the academic knowledge production space. Have you seen this space grow this year or is it contracting? How do you respond to Giraud's, you know, critique of the lack of China literacy and the poor understanding of China by so many in African presidents and prime ministers' offices? I agree with Giraud. Like, I think there is a massive China knowledge crisis, I think, in, in Africa. And it is significantly, I think, holding back what the continent can get from China, particularly now that China has to be coaxed to engage rather than, you know, kind of proactively going to places. And obviously, in, in terms of academic knowledge production, Africa-China studies continues, right? Kind of there's, there's all of this work continually coming out. But what we've said many times is that the people who really can use that insight, they tend to not engage with it, particularly African policymakers. And overall, I feel that in a lot of ways, what we're seeing now is Africa's loss rather than China's retreat. Like, I think this, like, kind of a, a really transformative kind of developmental relationship with China was 
possible, seemed possible for a while. And I think it was lost on the African side. And I think it's going to be tough to get back, I think. And just in, you know, in my own country, in, you know, kind of in, in South Africa, there is, and this is just from gauging from conversations with kind of policymakers who are, who are kind of in that and researchers particularly who are in that space, is that they tend to pick up a kind of a drop in interest in China, in Africa as a whole, but in South Africa, for example, specifically. You know, that is just too difficult and not worth it. And I feel that maybe is true for the broader Africa-China relationship, except for specific areas like critical minerals, for example, where the Chinese don't really have any choice but to engage with Africa. I don't know that this isn't a very optimistic moment, I think, in Africa-China relations. It isn't a kind of a go-go, like, you know, this is the future kind of moment. It seems like a kind of a lukewarm relationship for me at the moment, but who knows? Like, I think this coming year will be pivotal around those issues. And to the point that we've been making all year is that there's so much waste going on right now, intellectual waste. And what I mean by that, and this is something that Giraud has pointed out for years, is that Africa is rich in the resource of experienced, skilled, fluent Chinese scholars and students who have that experience. 60,000 students went to China to study before the pandemic. Tens of thousands continued to go. But when they come back, there are no opportunities for them. Governments, companies, scholars, universities, all are not engaging this amazing population of kids who are coming back with great skills and experience. You know, so one of the things that we've seen this past year is not only is the official thinking from many African governments on China not current, it's actually negative. And what I mean by that is that China has changed so much in the past couple of years, but the thinking is still caught back in 2017, 2018, as if, again, as Joel pointed out, China's going to write checks for a billion dollars. We say that that example is the best one because it comes from the Kenyan government, which not once, but twice this year, thought it was going to get a billion dollar loan from the Chinese, which is just never going to happen, given the fact that the Chinese just don't lend money anymore to Africa in those volumes. So, Giro, we'll give you the final thought on this one, because I know you think about it quite a bit. Give us very quickly, you know, react to what I and Kobus kind of said on this issue and just tell us what you think, you know, looking to the year ahead, is it going to get any better? Oh, I'm not really optimistic when I look at the China-Africa relation for the future in terms of improving China literacy. I do believe that many African countries are still going to stay in the way they approach China. And I think they're going to get frustrated by the fact that they don't get what they want from China and they're going to search for new partners. They're going to now turning into new countries that we see coming into the space where we see Turkish company coming into doing in infrastructure work and everything. But they will not really move into understanding what needs to be changed and how they need to approach China differently to get what they want. And that's what my fear is. Like we have that sense of laziness that you perceive in among many African leaders and policy making apparatus where there's no really self-introspection in terms of understanding what we are doing wrong and what needs to be changed. So I'm much more pessimistic into whether or not they're going to improve their knowledge about China if they're going even to change the approach of China. Okay, now let's move on to our second point of the year in review. I'll take this one. I say that 2023 was the year of critical minerals. So, Kobus, while you pointed out that investment by the Chinese in Africa is down, trade is flat, that is not the case when it comes to critical minerals. Huge investments in the DRC, in the Tenke Fungurume mine, were announced this year. They launched in Zimbabwe this year, processing of lithium at Prospect Lithium, that is China Zhejiang Huayo Cobalt, announced that in Nigeria. New processing deals were announced in Morocco. Processing deals were also announced for lithium. And then we have to talk about the DRC in particular, because the DRC, this was a turbulent year for the Chinese in the DRC when it comes to critical minerals, specifically copper and cobalt. They went under a huge amount of pressure, the Chinese companies, by the the Congolese government to restructure the contracts. They signed a deal, and Jero, you can tell us more about that, between the Tenkefu Fungurume mine and the Chinese, which is owned by a company called Simok. They settled that deal. And one of the things at the time when we said that they settled that deal, it said it really shows that after all of these years of the Chinese being in the DRC, they really know how to play the game. So this to me was the year when China stepped up its critical mineral mining 
in Africa and uh, made huge advances and really started to move a number of African countries up the value processing chain, something that the Americans and the Europeans have been talking about, but the Chinese actually did this year. And I think that was a huge event this year. Uh, Jeho, let's get your take. And then Kobus, I'd like to hear from you on this. Yes, of course, this year has been really interesting in, in that space of critical minerals. We saw how DRC has tried somehow to push Chinese companies and how it was really quite difficult. And mind you, it didn't start this year. This year was only the year where we saw a kind of solution to that crisis that started in mid-2021. It took a one year, almost two years to get resolved. So yeah, this year was really a year where we saw a lot of action in the critical mineral spaces where Chinese companies have been moving across the continent, in, especially in Southern Africa, where in the RC, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Tanzania, where investment have been ramping up with Chinese companies, even signing, you know, joint venture partnership with Western companies, especially Australian companies, you know, that was really interesting phenomenon to see and we're going to see much more of that happening. So in the space of the DRC. Yes, I've mentioned it earlier when I talked about President Chisekedi's trip to China. So yeah, China has managed to really see mock the Chinese company, China Molibe, that managed to really take, I'd say, its cut in that fight they had with Jekamin in DRC. They managed to lower the Jekamin uh, demand and they also managed to really spend it over so many years that at the end, they won't really feel it when they're going to pay back Jekamin. So it was really a strategic move that happened and I do believe that they know know how to read the time, the political time in DRC. We are in 2023. It was election year. It is election year in DRC. So they kind of knew how the DRC government is going to move around that time. So the pressure was much more on the DRC government than the Chinese side. So they kind of played that against them. So unfortunately for the DRC, they managed to get what they wanted, except what the DRC wanted. So it was really interesting move to see happening in that space. And we're going to see much more in the future, especially in 2024 with all those mining processes happening all over the place in the country. And Kobus, the question of critical minerals is one of those areas that overlaps with the great power competition with the United States, which also manifested itself this year. Well, exactly. And this is actually why I also chose critical minerals as my number three kind of thematic for the year. Because, you know, among other reasons, there's, as, as Jiro was pointing out, there was a lot going on in the space this year. And one of the most notable ones for me was the fact that Zimbabwe managed to pressure China into building refining facilities, which is kind of unprecedented, you know, kind of in Africa and, um, and a, a, a massive achievement. And at the same time, a very revealing achievement in the sense that it maybe only was possible because of Western sanctions which created this environment where for this kind of free space for the Chinese to operate, which also created a relationship that ended up giving Zimbabwe leverage to impose a ban on the export of raw ore, you know, based to a large extent on Indonesia's ban um, for nickel, um, and then to force the Chinese companies to not only refine there, but to also actually you know, kind of generate electricity there in order to run the refiners. So that was a very interesting kind of development and stood in revealing contrast with all of the announcements from the EU and the US around, you know, these logistic corridors that, that are connecting the DRC's border with Lubita Port in, in Angola, which, you know, kind of looks great. Like, there's, there's a lot going on there. And, you know, it, it dovetails with global gateway projects on green hydrogen, like very fancy in Namibia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, it still is all extractive. Like, there's no refining of cobalt being paid for by the US in the DRC. That's just not happening. So, well, they've been trying to with that deal with the Zambians and the Congolese and you yeah, know, I mean, that deal has been such a such a zombie, right? I mean, here we are. We've passed the one-year anniversary of that deal, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, very quickly remind everybody of what that was. It was an MOU signed in December last year during the U.S.-Africa Leadership Summit in D.C., where the U.S. signed a trilateral uh, agreement with the DRC and Zambia to develop supply chain of critical minerals locally in the DRC and Zambia. But since then, it's remained an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, and so far, no agreement has been made or done on the ground. So yeah, we're still waiting for that to happen. But Kobus, you know, speaking of the U.S. very quickly, and I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's worth reflecting on the year in review for the U.S. The White House released a summary, a bullet point of all the things that they accomplished since the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit last December. And it was a pretty long list. And it does feel like this year, while as the Chinese may have disengaged in some respects, that the United States re-engaged or engaged for the first time in a long time. What would you kind of summarize the year for the United States in Africa? 
Yes, I mean, this has been an interesting year, you know, kind of in that respect, in the sense that there was, there seemed to be behind the scenes political will to move the relationship forward, you know, and, and just a lot of a lot of visits, for example, by different kind of high level US officials to Africa. So that was that was very interesting to see, obviously, because of crisis late in the year, particularly around Israel, President Joe Biden ended up not visiting Africa, despite that being flagged earlier this year. But, you know, overall, a lot of this relationship was clearly focused on critical minerals and on a kind of a geopolitical competition around critical minerals, you know, with China. But at the same time, there also seemed to be an interest in renewing the relationship and trying to kind of change some of the terms of the relationship. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, how much of that kind of survives into like past the 2024 election. Okay, let's move on now to our next one. Kobus, I think you are in fact next up for what is your story or theme that we should focus on for 2023. My second one is about debt. And this has been a, like a massive sprawling story that we were <laughs> covering obsessively. You know, and there isn't really one story there. It's in the, the if, if, if I would were to kind of just sum up my main kind of take on it is that the international development financing system is broken. It's, it's really super broken to the extent that we now, I think we're like, Countries that do slide into debt distress seem doomed to multi-year, extremely painful processes that might not lead anywhere. I mean, with Zambia has been stuck in this for about two, three years now, and you know, kind of, and, and we still have like their, their deal recently just collapsed again. And you know, there's been a lot of really excellent research done on debt that we've been covering this year. And what some of that is showing is that. In addition to all of the lending that China has been doing, it also does liquidity support lending. So essentially almost like a, you know, kind of like short term lending to tide countries over so that they don't slide into debt distress. So that obviously changes their debt, their debt portfolios. And so, so that's a, a really important and interesting development. Another one is the situation in Sri Lanka where the debt renegotiation process is now has been so messed up in Sri Lanka that China is doing side deals with Sri Lanka and not even particularly kind of taking part in the bilateral creditor kind of conversations. It's going to, it's, it attends them as an observer, not as a, as a full participant. So all of these different data points, including the different African countries that are nearing debt distress are already in it, you know, including kind of Ghana and Ethiopia, are raising these questions about like once a country is in debt distress, how do they get out? What is the future of IMF-led, you know, unified debt processes when side deals are now part of what we're talking about you know what is the role of western private creditors which you know still own the majority of african debt and that that western policymakers are not even talking about at all so all of this is, is, a, is a kind of a situation of like debt super broken <laughs> you know like, like really really messed up Kobus, um, i'm not i'm not going to agree with you that western policymakers aren't talking about it the, what they're doing is they're talking about it oftentimes in the context that it's China's fault. Yes. That was Janet Yellen's message when she came to Zambia. Uh, they never talk about the private bondholders. Yes, it's worse than doing nothing. They're actively adding kind of like bad information into the mix. Yeah, and they, they keep having this faith that the G20 system somehow works or that the common framework somehow works when, Kobus, as you've rightly pointed out, none of these systems work. And meantime, Zambia, potentially Ethiopia, Ghana, any number of these debt distressed countries are just circling the toilet bowl. It's really been tragic to watch what happens. The economic aftershocks of these debt distresses, it goes right down to the bottom line of a family anywhere on the continent. And it's just tragic that they can't figure out a way to fix this. And like what, what we're increasingly seeing is that if you happen to be a government where your country is, is in debt distress, like, are you even talking to the IMF or the G20 first? Or are you just directly calling China? You know, it's like that. That you know that that is one of the one of the interesting questions. So sorry, go go ahead. Yeah, but yeah, but see again, just to to play a little bit devil's advocate here for all of the poo pooing of the international system, everybody goes crawling back to the IMF, and the IMF has been central in these discussions at every step of the way. And so a little bit that China's retreated a little bit, and so there's been all this kind of denunciation of the Western led international order, but yet it's the IMF that is always at the table on these conversations. Without fail. I mean, I guess, but at the same time, in what way, right? Kind of like, is the IMF really a proactive, like, valuable member there, or is it just the least bad option? Giraud, what do you think? 
I think the IMF just stands as they present themselves the land of last resort in a way that they cannot not be there, you know, because if they are not there, I think they're going to lose the legitimacy. They're going to leave the space that where China wanted to, to, to happen, I do believe, the space where you say we want new players, we want a new financial context and system where we have new players that, uh, that are coming into the fold. So IMF being there today, I do believe it's much more, beyond the protocol side, I think it's much more they need to remain relevant in that space because if they do retreat from that space what's going to be left is going to be everything they've built over the years especially in Africa when it comes to finance is just going to collapse we're going to have China imposing new rules and new norms and new approach which they don't so that's why Instead of being absent, they would rather be there. And if they are there, where this way I can concur with the corpus is like when they are there, sometimes they are there with you know some approach that are just not really helpful. And I remember we all remember different comments coming from Christina Georgieva, the IMF director, when she went to Zambia and in different IMF conference, when the way she was speaking about the debt issue in Africa and she was talking about China and everything. That's where you kind of wonder: are they there just to make a point, or are they there really to solve an issue on the ground? to be a real actor on the ground. So that's where it's sometime you, you got to have the, you, you kind of wonder if they're just there to save face and to remain relevant in that discussion. I see it differently than you guys because I see that the bondholders and the creditor committees are looking to the IMF as a neutral arbiter in some of these respects, that everybody wants to sign the IMF deal first, then they can proceed with the debt restructurings. And the IMF is absolutely central to these conversations. Whether it's effective or not is a different story. And again, looking back on 2023, one of the major stories of the year was how the Chinese wanted to try and change the rules of how the IMF participates in these debt restructuring deals. So if we recall for much of this year, the Chinese in the Zambian debt restructuring deal wanted the IMF to take losses on its debt the same way that the Chinese and private creditors might. That was a fight that stalled the Zambian deal for many, many months And the Chinese were not successful in the end, but it was definitely one of the highlights of the year in terms of looking back on the year in debt restructuring. So Cobus could not agree more that debt restructuring was definitely one of the top stories, and it will probably be one of the major themes of 2024. So Ethiopia now is in its debt restructuring phase. It will probably not be the last African country that undergoes either some form of default or restructuring. A number of countries are on that list, so that's something we'll keep an eye on for next year as well. Giro, let's go to your next top story of 2023. Oh, my next top story for 2023, I think we're going to have to overlap because it was about critical minerals in China, how China has been moving into that space. And I think it was kind of predictable since I'm the critical mineral guy in, <laughs> and I've been covering the story for so long. So that was my story for 2023. And uh, I think we spoke about everything that's still relevant to talk about. For me, it's more of into looking how China is going to play a much more constructive role into building Africa supply chain. Because so far, they're in pole position in many African countries in terms of exploration, in terms of operation. Now they're building processing plants in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Zambia, in, in Zimbabwe as well. But now how they're going to move forward beyond that, how they're going to really play a constructive way in that space. This is for me the place to look for in 2024. And especially now you have in the background, you have the China-US rivalry in that space where US is proposing alternative to African countries. How China is going to respond to those alternatives? Because the reality is China cannot just limit itself into doing basic refinery. They're going to have to do refinery transformation. They're going to have to be enriching the lithium and the cobalt. They're going to Why do you say they have to? Why do you say they have to? I mean, they don't have to do anything. They don't have to do anything. That's true. And from an economic perspective, they don't have to do anything. But from a political perspective, when you see how African countries are really pushing for that to happen, especially when you look at how Western countries are also trying to move forward, it's creating a competition where African countries now do have options. Now, the question is how much... Western countries are going to move from the MOUs phases to real agreement. I think once they move into those real agreements with African countries, it's going to create a new shift into the space where Chinese company will have to at some point say that we have to do much more than what we are doing right now. Because especially if those African countries are starting to get much more from Western investors. 
I would add to that that in, in relation to having to, I think w one of the reasons why they might want to is that it provides them a hedge against what now seems certain as increasing kind of anti-Chinese pressure in imports and supply chains, particularly into Europe and the US. So we're already seeing that in the EV sector, you know, very large Chinese migration to Mexico, for example, and also into places like Morocco, you know, kind of where, where it kind of adds this kind of hedge against, you know, possible plans of Chinese products being like, oh, no, this comes from Morocco, you know? Yeah. One other thing to keep an eye out for next year, again, that started this year, and Giro, you and I have been focusing on this a lot in our coverage, is you talked about supply chains, the logistics, that is the routes that the minerals are taking from Zambia, from Namibia, and specifically from the DRC to the various ports. That underwent a lot of change this year. So we saw, of course, a lot of coverage about the Lubito Corridor that the United States is trying to revitalize. And then at the same time, though, Giro, there is two new routes that are being revitalized as well, one into the port of Barra in Mozambique and the other into the port of Dar es Salaam. Tell us a little bit about the changes that we've seen this year in the transport routes from the mines to the ports. Oh yeah, we've seen a lot of movement happening there where we saw Trafigura coming into the Beras, the Lobito Benguela space with the help of the Americans trying to see how they're going to invest 250 million into refurbishing the railway and to extending it to Zambia into the DRC to connect them. We also saw in the other side where Zambia, DRC and Tanzania are trying to refurbish a bridge that's going to allow them to connect them with the Dar es Salaam corridor to go straight to Dar es Salaam port. We see a lot of movements happening there and we also see China being present there where we saw now China coming back into the Tazara space where they're talking about maybe a billion dollar investment or PPP agreements kind of to allow them to have also their own, not their own not their own railway, but to have a kind of railway they control since they have lost the Lobito railway because let's keep in mind that they were also competing against Trafigura on that side, but they lost on that side. So now maybe the Tazara one is now the option for them to have all also a supply chain they can control much. So it's a very interesting period of time. We're going to see much more of that happening. And uh, for me, I'm really looking forward on how it's going to change Africa integration, all these railways and all these projects on the continent. I think a real test case of African agency is going to be whether it's possible for them to build that 100 kilometer link to connect the Lubito railways that are being funded by the EU and the US with the Tazara railway. Like there's been kind of, you know, calls for that and like discussions of that in Africa. And I don't think either the US, the EU or China are necessarily that enthusiastic about that. Like it obviously makes massive sense for Africa, you know, kind of because that, that would be the first, like this dream, long held dream of like having a little rail connection from the east of Africa to the west of Africa that they're still not, no way on the continent has that. Um, and it's only 100 kilometers, you know, so this will be a real test case for where the African leaders can get what they want. And my understanding on that is that the U.S. does want to do that, but it's the Chinese that are not thrilled about the idea. So to your point, Kobus, it's going to be interesting to see if the various impacted African countries can assert themselves to try and force this to happen, given it's in their interest to do so. So that'll definitely be something to watch out for next year. Moving on with our next story for year of 2023, I'm going to say mine, and I think this touches on what both of you have said to some degree, is that the Belt and Road really changed this year. This was the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. Africa, in many cases, is a showcase for what Giraud talked about, the small is beautiful. Now, again, we've talked about this all year. It's In Chinese, it's called xiao armei, which is small, moreover beautiful. We've talked about it as small and beautiful. The point is, though, that the small part are projects under $50 million, maybe $100 million. And the beautiful part is that they are much more compliant with ESG standards. They also have more community engagement. And in many ways, we're seeing across the continent, particularly in the energy sector and the telecom sector, a lot of activity by the Chinese in these small projects. So while we've said that Africa is not getting the huge $6 billion railway deals, and there's no talk of building the kind of large-scale infrastructure that the Chinese once built in Africa, there is a lot of talk about the small telecom, connectivity, logistics, and energy projects that all fall under the new 
mantra of small is beautiful as part of Belt and Road in the next 10 years ahead. Kobus, your reflections on the Belt and Road in Africa in 2023. This is one of those things that, you know, kind of where I think a lot will be clarified by FOCAC, you know, like at the end of 2024, because there was a lot of... Just remind everybody, it's been three years since we talked about FOCAC. Remind everybody what FOCAC (laughs) is. The Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, it's the three-yearly like big summit. So that's always like China, Africa, you know, like big meeting. And we're already now in a process where African policymakers are working behind the scenes to set up the agenda. And, you know, kind of every three years, it's a big kind of like temperature check of the of the relationship. And it's coming up in late 2024. And, you know, so there's been so much big talk about the new Belt and Road, about this uh, kind of vague, big announcements coming out of the Belt and Road Forum, that as always with the Belt and Road Initiative, it's very difficult to say what is real and what is you know what is just just hot air and i think in the case of africa we really only will see you know kind of by the time that 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 folk 2024 gets announced we'll see how much of this new but this kind of Belt and Road 3.0 has now actually been extended to Africa, or whether it, Africa is even in that conversation. For me, I do believe that that 2.0 Belt and Road Initiative is a very interesting one to see. As I was saying earlier, it's about how African countries are understanding that first, because I have the feeling that when you talk with different African decision makers and policy makers, they're kind of, I don't know, they're disconnected to the reality of what it is and what's happening. Maybe because China is not really articulating it so clearly for them to kind of understand what China means. But I have the feeling that many African countries still don't get it. They don't understand what does it mean, where we are going with that, and how they can really jump into it, or if there is a space for them to exist in that. And it's also going to be a a good opportunity for many of them to kind of be more disciplined when it comes to financing, because the fact that China was giving a lot of money all the time, it was made a lot of them say undisciplined when it comes to financing, so that's why we see some of them being in a crisis right now. But I do believe with the Belt and Road 2.0, there's going to be an opportunity for them to kind of review the way they find financing for the project, maybe now do the reform that we needed to begin with to attract new funding from new partners. Maybe that's going to be the way for them to move forward. I don't know. I think that's going to be an opportunity for them to have a much more healthier financing space where to attract different financing for them. Okay, let's move on very quickly. Time is running out. One of the commitments that we've made this year in our podcast is to make sure we stay under an hour. So very quickly, Kobus, let's get your third point of 2023 as a highlight of China-Africa relations. This may not be as fast as, as we would like. I'll explain why. Like I, I, I chose this point. Um, for me, Israel has been the biggest kind of like talking point around this issue, even though it was not in Africa. Israel. Yes. yes in China-Africa actually. relations. Okay, you're going to have to guide us down the path on this one. The reason for that is one of the things that I became very aware of over the last few years, particularly in you know in the context of what we discussed in relation to the shrinking of the Africa-China relationship and the the kind of limits in that relationship, the lack of literacy, the you know, and so on. One of the things that that has become very clear to me is that to a, a, such a fundamental extent, the Africa-China relationship is still happening in a landscape that's set by Western power. It still is seen as the counterexample to Western power, as some kind of other option to Western power, and therefore it also, because of that continuation of Western power in Africa, as, you know, for example, you know, the top the top kind of like foreign direct investors in, in Africa, still US, UK, France, Germany, you know. So all of that is, is taking place in a context in which the West has this essentially presented itself as post-imperial, right? Kind of like its wealth was built on all these empires in the past, but now the West is presenting itself as, you know, pushing universal values, right? Kind of like, in, you know, in the, in the words of Joe Biden, you know, autocracies versus democracies, pushing and promoting democracies, supporting democracies, supporting human rights. And, you know, kind of in which China is the kind of like the counterexample to that. I think all of that collapsed <laughs> due to the crisis in Israel and Western countries positioning in, that, in the crisis in Israel. I think the last few months has really revealed is that for all of this talk about universal values and human rights and so on, 
so much of Western engagement in the world, when it comes down to the nitty gritty and crisis moments like in Israel, is really still all about empire. And even within that empire project, so much of it is actually still about white whiteness, about the politics of whiteness. And that one sees playing out in these kind of rightward lurches in European politics, in the resurgence of Trumpism in the US, in the kind of like hysterical kind of conversations about migration that's happening in, in these countries. So, you know, kind of where that leaves us is in this kind of weird, kind of like like an open field. <laughs> it's like because China doesn't really have the energy to put up any kind of counter vision for the world, right? Kind of, and on specific kind of like core issues like human rights, like environmental governance, China is a basket case in lots of ways, right? Kind of, it's, it's, it's an extremely difficult partner to work with and, you know, kind of, and very problematic in many of the things it does. So is India, so is Saudi Arabia, so is the United Arab Emirates. There is no replacement for what the West represented, except for the fact that the West actually didn't represent what they said they were representing. And so I think we'll, we're at, like, which is a kind of a long-winded way of saying stuff's bleak. Like stuff at the end of 2023 is so much bleaker than that even was at the at the end of 2022, which I didn't think was possible. Because what I think now is that a everyone now now knows that you can get away with a genocide. You can. Everyone also knows that might makes right, right? Kind of like whether you're dealing with the West, whether you're dealing with China, that's going to be the the default kind of you know situation with everyone. And so, in the absence of any kind of like coherent, shared future vision coming from Africa, which I have not seen, like Africa, I think is really a laggard in 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 kind of presenting any kind of like like vision for the world. There is no vision for the world, right? Kind of like because the one that that the that the West said they represented ended up being revealed as essentially a mirage, and China, etc., like China and company don't re don't represent any of that, right? Kind of they don't they don't have any replacement. So I think this is. A kind of a long-winded way of saying that we're much more in a kind of a wild west situation at the end of 2023 than we even were at the end of 2022 and i think it's gonna really hit in africa like it's gonna it's gonna like human rights issues like you know kind of governance issues environmental issues i think are gonna decline in africa partly because of this it's really funny because that was also my third topic. My third topic was really coming from that. You remember the, uh, the colonel wrote about how Gaza situation is kind of legitimizing Chinese narrative in Africa. So yeah, it stemmed from that. So yeah, the situation in Gaza, how the international community, the Western government has reacted to that is kind of like uh, compared to how they reacted to what's happened in Ukraine and, and how they kind of, I wouldn't say bullied, but how they kind of wanted African country to take a stand to be on the right side of history in terms of international rule-based order and everything. And how they react differently when it comes to the situation in Gaza kind of legitimize China discourse in Africa. And this is why I was saying yeah, that situation itself kind of opened the doors to Chinese influence, much more political influence in Africa. And I'm talking about that having in mind the fact that for example, this year we saw Xi Jinping thought being translated in Swahili and now being available in Tanzania, in Kenya, and Uganda, where the books has been sold, and seeing how, for example, China Global Civilization Initiative is been now talked about and even studied in country like Uganda with Ugandan leaders and also in Tanzania. All those Chinese initiatives are now taking much more space and places in Africa among the decision makers, having in the background how they look into the international order and they see the double standard that, that's appearing when it comes to. Gaza, when you come to Ukraine, and you are from an African perspective, you are kind of like, you know, we can get away with many things. I think that there's no real order, there's no morality that any country or any Western country can impose on us. So at this point, when China say, you know, you have your own history, you have your own path, you you have your own path to development and security, and you have to follow that. Those becoming music to the heels, they become more sensitive to that. So that's why I believe that that's what happened this year is going really to open much more space for China to be much more present and influential in a way that African politics are seeing the politics of international order and that's where they can become objective, they can become China objective ally when it comes to new multilateral system in the world that China has been pleading for.
I mean, for me, like the feeling is just that I, I think to a certain extent, China lacks the bandwidth to kind of step into that role. You know, kind of like it, 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 it feels to me at the moment that China doesn't really have a, a fully global vision. All of the, the kind of global civilization is shift, global development is shift and so on. Like, obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of writing there, you know, it's like like thousands of lines of text. But a lot of it is so non-committal and so vague that it doesn't leave China on the hook for anything. And at the same time, I think China's focus really is only about China. It's, its bandwidth is only covering China. You know, it doesn't have space in its brain for anything more, I think. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have said that China is the ultimate realpolitik country, that it really focuses very narrowly on its interest, masquerading oftentimes with a global agenda. But at the end of the day, it's pursuing its own narrow interests, which, again, I don't know if we can blame China for doing that. That is what most countries, if you are a realist, you know, again, thinking back to 2023, the passing of Henry Kissinger, who was the kind of the grandfather of realism in many respects, this is what countries do, is they pursue their own narrow interests. And China seems to be very much an adherent to that strategy. Okay, gentlemen, let's wrap up our discussion very quickly. And I'm hoping you guys are going to be very, very quick because we're going to dedicate an entire show to 2024. But give us one very quick thing for people to look ahead in 2024 in the Africa-China relationship. For me, I'm going to go back to what I've talked before about China and African critical minerals. We're going to be seeing much more Chinese action and presence in that space. And uh, for me, let's really pay attention how China is going to change and how China is going to maneuver Africa demand in that area, especially now that they might have real competitive actors on the ground with the US and with the European countries coming into that space. Let's see how they're going to move in that. Mine is going to be the focus on new energy. I think you're going to see just an enormous push by the Chinese in battery storage, in solar panels, in all sorts of new energy initiatives across the continent. This is all part of the smallest, beautiful push by the Chinese in the Belt and Road. Kobus, in your neighborhood, in South Africa, the Chinese have been absolutely instrumental in the expansion of solar power, battery power, and really trying to mitigate the effects of your completely incompetent, dysfunctional power system that ESCOM runs. I think we're going to see that across the continent and a huge push in renewable and small energy projects across the continent. Kobus, last word to you on 2024. Mine is also renewable energy, but I think I'm a little less optimistic than you. Like in, in the sense that if you say that we will see a large increase, like I, I'm more on the level of like, let's see what happens. Like I, I think in lots of ways, with the Belt and Road Forum particularly set up the kind of rhetorical basis for an expansion of Chinese, you know, renewable energy into the rest of the world. Uh, you know, in, in a similar way as that the original coining of the Belt and Road was essentially a narrative that then led to a lot of companies kind of getting into formation. Like, I think the the smallest, beautiful, and kind of new Belt and Road kind of announcements that we saw at the Belt and Road Forum is also setting that kind of political scene, you know, kind of that, that in theory would, like, get Chinese finances, Chinese private sector companies that dominate the solar industry rather than state-owned enterprises, and, you know, kind of other Chinese players to step into that field. I, however, as a South African, have a very strong awareness of African leaders' utter contempt for their own populations. So the fact that there's massive demand for electricity in Africa, the fact that you can actually make a lot of money out of that demand doesn't necessarily count for anything, you know, kind of among African policymakers. I would be very, very happy if what you kind of like outlined actually comes to pass, you know, because Africa has a massive energy deficit and a massive climate problem. So, you know, so both, so both would, be, would be solved with that. However, I think you can never say enough bad things about African policymakers, and I'd be surprised if they actually rise to the challenge. I grant you all of that, but it was you who a couple of weeks ago in one of our discussions about climate mentioned that South Africa's added multiple gigawatts of new power just in the form of rooftop solar panels, Yes, most of which I presume come from China. Most of which is still in contravention to what the government wants to do. And you have to actually, like, there's still no kind of, like, setup to really feed anything back into the grid. It still is, like, dependent on middle class people paying it for themselves, whereas poor people are simply abandoned with no electricity access at all. So, you know, sorry, but, like, that, that actually fits into my narrative, I think.
Okay, there we go. We're going to end on a rather cynical note. So again, next year, we're going to do a whole look ahead into what to look for. And we're going to then survey experts around the world who study this. It's a fun show we do every year as well. Gentlemen, this was fantastic. As always, I enjoy this show because we cover so much ground. Just very quickly before we go, Cobus, one of the traditions of this program, too, is to express our gratitude and our sincere thanks to you, our listeners, our subscribers, our followers on social media. This has been a big year for the China Global South Project. If you go to our website, chinaglobalsouth.com, you'll see just the site is just enormous now. I mean, Cobus, it's just unbelievable to think of where we've come in just the past few years. And the need for the kind of news and analysis that the team is doing, and we've, we're up to 10 people now in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Giro and Cobus are leading that team and is so dire right now because of the polarization of news, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, all of the toxicity on social media. And we are trying to be an oasis of sanity. <laughs> and so I, that's the goal. And Joe, you've done some amazing work this year. Congratulations on the Cobalt Project, this data project. This typifies what we're trying to do. So amazing. And we have a nickel project from Indonesia coming out next year. Our colleague in Jakarta, Antonia Timmerman, just did a beautiful multimedia interactive documentary on quartz mining in Indonesia that feeds the solar industry. That's available for everybody. It's not behind the paywall. I encourage you to check it out. But Kobus, I mean, just heartfelt gratitude. We've been doing this for 14 years, and the only reason we've been able to do this for 14 years is because of the generosity of our supporters. Yeah, absolutely. We're so inspired by that and we're so grateful for it. And, and we hope to keep producing kind of stuff that people find interesting. So gentlemen, thank you so much for all of your hard work this year. We want to again thank all of you in our audience for listening to us. Giro, myself, and Cobus will be back again next year. We're going to take a short two-week break over the holidays, but we'll be back in early January with, we do about 50 shows a year for this thing. I mean, it's really incredible, but uh, there's so much to talk about, as you can see from this episode. So for Gironima in Mauritius and Kobus van Staten in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at chinaglobalsouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrique on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.